started. Awesome. Okay, so for everyone that just joined in, it looks like we have quite a few people here uh, for the actual meeting itself. Um, we are going to be recording this. It is going to be available on the website. If you go to bottega.edu, go to Career Services, then Live Events. It's under Dev Meets. Um, this recording will be there. And then also, if you want to watch any of the other ones from uh, previous months, they'll be there as well. Um, please have everyone keep your microphones off and your cameras off. Um, there is a chat function below. So if you guys have questions throughout it, go ahead and put the questions down in the chat function and we will get to them um, as we see them come through. Um, I am really excited. I'm Christina. I'm part of the Career Services team here at Bottega University. Um, I am going to be uh, doing this event with uh, Alex, who is our uh, Bottega University full stack instructor. I'm going to be going over uh, networking and talking a little bit to you guys uh, to the new uh, starts that have started uh, recently, as well as uh, going over networking and how we do that uh, while in school and out of school. And then Alex is going to talk to us about capstone projects, introduce us to them and talk about how they work. Um, I'm really excited because this event here is specifically designed for networking. And so we get to talk about networking and kind of go over things for everyone that's been here before and those that are new. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, for those just out of curiosity, if you are new, Put in the chat function new and what state you're in. I'm really curious to see uh, where we're all located and where we're all at. Um, I always find it fascinating that we usually have a good mixture of uh, people that have been in the program and those that have been uh, just started either a month or two already. So I'm excited. Um, okay, so it looks like we've got a new one from uh, Utah. Woo, that's where I'm located. That's awesome. We've got uh, one from Montana, North Carolina, Wisconsin. Oh my goodness, we're all over the place. Uh, Delaware, South Carolina. Oh my goodness, lots of South Carolinas. Nice, represent, I love it. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit. I wanna first start off with uh, talking to you new guys and those that are uh, pretty recent to uh, the pro program. Give me one second here while I share my screen so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Here we go. Awesome. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Actually, let me do this. Oh, sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. There we go. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Hopefully you guys can see it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about staying motivated throughout the course. A lot of you guys are new. We just started the course and there's those that have been in the course for a while. So they uh, pretty much can recommend this as well. But um, let's talk about staying motivated and how that works. One of the first things that we talk talk to our students about is about what is your why? What is your story? Why did you get into this? Um, it's really important that when you are going through the program to remember why we're doing this. For some, it is uh, we just want to have a more st stable uh, environment. We want to provide for our families or it's I want to learn a new skill. I want to learn uh, to re retool myself and get into a new industry. So remembering your why is good, especially when you get frustrated and you're at a point where you're not sure how to proceed and you're getting frustrated. Uh, it's good to remember your why, to remember why we're doing this. Um, the other thing is about tracking your progress. Um, it's really nice within all of our programs, there's gonna be an easy way to track it, but also keeping tabs on your skill level and where you're getting at. Um, when you first start, you're gonna be starting in very basic uh, concepts and you're gonna move all the way up to the point where you're uh, competent base where you're able to do it yourself. But that in between part is kind of a little bit tricky and you're not sure where you're at. So always try and keep a mental progress of where did I start? Where am I going? The other thing I want to talk to you guys about is if you are in the part-time program. So we've got our two different courses. You can be full uh, full time, which is basically where everything's scheduled out. It's structured. You show up, you're there. That's how it works. But then you've got uh, another course you can go, which is the self-paced one. And that's where you make your own schedule. It is self-paced, so you get to decide when you're going to do it, but I definitely recommend actually making structured time to work on stuff. Um, so for instance, if you know you're going to do 20 hours a week or 15 hours a week, um, set up a time on your calendar and schedule that out. So that way you don't have to try and figure out when am I going to fit this in? You already know when it's going to. And then when that time comes, you don't have to worry about, okay, did I get my stuff done? You know you got your stuff done because you scheduled it out. 
There are two uh, following ones, which is uh, finding a project that you could be passionate about. We're going to help you with projects, but I want you to think of some projects that you actually want to build out. And there's always a good goal to have to say, hey, I'm going to have a capstone project at the end. What do I want to build out for that? And Alex is going to talk to you guys about that uh, at the end, but try to think about what do you want to build out? What do you want to do? And then the next two are very similar to each other. Uh, talk about what you're doing to other people and post about what you're about your progress. The first one is to keep you motivated. To have someone to talk to about it means that you're accountable. The second one is to keep a record of what you're doing. You will find that as you start posting, it's not just for everyone else, it's also for yourself. So you will find that when you get to maybe halfway part through the program, you'll look back and say, oh, I can't believe I started just doing you know, HTML and CSS and now I'm doing you know, X, Y, and Z or now I'm doing my capstone project. It's good to have something to go back and have a physical digital representation of where did I start? And I love it when I get to see students that post about, hey, I'm working on my, my coding foundations challenge. They take a picture, they take a screenshot and they show it on their, on their uh, LinkedIn or their Instagram or even on their Facebook. It's awesome because I get to see the progress, but then also when they come into my uh, area, which is uh, for career services, I get to see where do they start and where are they now? I get to see the progression and it's really exciting for me as well. And then the last one is celebrating your wins. Um, these are uh, an easy one. Whenever you do something right, just give yourself a pat on the back. You did it, You great job, just keep going. <laughs> and then uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is finding your people. Now, when you're in the full-time course, this is a little bit easier. Your, your people is gonna be uh, uh, a little bit easier to find because you've got everyone in the class with you. Um, for part-time, we're going to go over some tips and tricks on how to do that. But some of the good tips are things like uh, developer Slack or Discord channels. They're amazing. Finding a language you like and then finding a Discord channel, just Google, you know, React, Discord, you'll find a channel to connect with. Um, LinkedIn, uh, even uh, Reddit is a really good one uh, to be able to look at what people are doing for projects or what their experience is in the industry. Lots of great stuff. And then the last one I'm going to talk about now is the university uh, having connections with the students and alumni. So let's actually, let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so if you've never used the chat function in DevCamp, this is how it works. You're going to click on the support tab, which is at the top of your account, and you'll click on chats. You can set up a chat with anyone within the curriculum within in the, the class of the course here using their name or their email. So if you're the type of person on this event here that you're like, I want to network, I want to find a study buddy, I want to find someone to connect with, put your email or your name in the chat function, let people know who you are, and then feel free to reach out to people through uh, the chat function. Um, again, you just need to have the uh, name and the email, but then that'll allow you to actually connect with each other and be able to have someone to, to talk to. And you can do chats as well as share code if you want it, if you want to do a rubber ducky at someone and say, hey, can I just talk to you about my problem? I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. I just want to talk to you and figure it out myself. Uh, we've got that built-in feature where you can do that. But yeah, go ahead. If you guys are like, hey, I want to find a study buddy, put it in the chat function. That's what we're here to do is we're here to support each other and find uh, our common goal and connection with each other. So don't ever feel like, you know, it's weird to be like, I want to connect with someone. Go ahead and put it in there. Um, the other thing that I was going to talk to you guys about uh, is networking. So now that we're done with that, um, let's talk about networking. Networking is a it's a tool that can be used for multiple different things. Usually when I say networking, people usually think of sales, they think of marketing, and they think of maybe job searching. But networking is a tool that can be used for lots of different stuff, not just those in particular stuff. It's indiscriminative. It is basically uh, creating a shared bond with someone that has similar goals and values and interests to you. Uh, looking around, I can see lots of people in this meeting right here that have a lot of shared interests, a lot of shared goals. We're all here for a very similar reason, um, which means that we're all here to support each other. We're all here to create a support system. That being said, awesome. So Peter went ahead and put his information and that's awesome. Um, so with that being said, there are a lot of outcomes you can get with networking. You could get a job opportunities, you can find industry connections, uh, new learning opportunities, finding career advice, uh, technical growth, and also emotional support. So when I say that uh, networking is a tool that is indiscriminative, what I mean by that is you may go into networking to do one thing, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing you're gonna get out of it. It is a give and take relationship. You're building a relationship with uh, multiple different people of saying, hey, this is what I have to offer. This is what I'm looking to do. 
and you're looking for those people to do the exact same thing with you. Um, so for instance, you may go into this saying, hey, I'm looking to find someone to help me figure out an industry connection. But you may also find someone who might be a senior developer who could be a mentor and help you with learning, actually look over your portfolio, tell you what you can do to improve, talk about actual languages that you should be going into post-graduation, or even helping you figure out what to work on with your portfolio. So when you go into networking, don't ever think of just having it be like a shotgun method of like, I only want one thing. I only want to do this one. Think of it more of, I'm going to put out the seed and whatever comes back will help me grow as a person. Um, and just be open to any opportunity that comes back to you. So it could be something as simple as, I'm reaching out to someone to say, hey, I noticed you, uh, you know, you're a friend of mine. We've known each other for a while. I noticed your company has a website. Um, I am wanting to... Uh, build out my skills and learn how to build. I'd love to help you build out the website for your guys' company and help update it. And they may say, you know, I don't need that, but we would love to have you come and actually help with X, Y, and Z. Or I have a friend that's actually wanting to get into the industry. Can you talk to them about software engineering? Or I know someone who's in the industry who can talk to you about this. Be open to whatever comes your way. It's kind of like putting out good vibes, and letting good vibes come back. Don't be so um, focused on getting one outcome that you miss out on every other opportunity that may come from networking. So that's what comes of it. Um, and usually at that point, people are like, okay, I love the idea. Let's do this. How do I do it? <laughs> so there are lots of different ways to go about this. Um, I'm going to go over three good tips on how to do this. Um, and the three different ones are three different approaches. They aren't the only ones. They're just three main ones that we usually see in our industry. So the first one is kind of what we said before, find your people, join a developer network. You're going to want to do things like finding a Slack channel, maybe even finding some, uh, you know, uh, live events you can go to, uh, maybe doing a Discord channel. Uh, Reddit's a really good one. Uh, volunteer work actually is another really good one. Um, we had a alumni come on last year and he talked a little bit about his journey into the software development industry and he talked about how he did volunteer work for his wife's company his name is uh, Sam Cook in case you're wondering um, he he offered to help out his wife's company which was a nonprofit for women uh, from that sprout, sprouted an opportunity for him to work with the university and from that sprouted an opportunity for him to work as a full-time software engineer so he went into it to help his wife <laughs> got out of it an opportunity to learn and then got out of it an opportunity to actually get into the industry. So don't ever feel like it's going to be a linear option for you. There may be lots of different branches that'll sprout out and you just need to be open to whatever opportunity comes your way. Um, uh, let me take a second real quick and let's look at some of the questions, see if there's any questions I'm missing. Let's see here. I love it. Everyone's putting in their, their information there. Yeah. Uh, feel free to use the chat function as much as you want. Uh, obviously, keep it all school related and be appropriate. But yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Um, on my, oh, no, that, that's for something else. I'm on module one as well, doing search engine for daily smarty today. Love it. I love it. Love it. That's a good one, too. You learn a lot on that one. Let's see here. There are so many opportunities. Yeah. So, uh, Jim Cap says there's so many opportunities out there there right now. There's so many. Yeah. There is a big demand for software engineers and a shortage of software engineers. So it's a good time to get into the industry. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So second one you can do is participate in networking events, uh, job fairs. We post about job fairs uh, in uh, for all of our alumni and also our graduates. So there's lots of opportunities for there, but there's also things like meetups locally to your area, um, as well as virtual ones. If you go to meetup.com, you'll be able to find some there. Um, Fairstream, which is a partnership company of ours. This is a really great one. It's on our homepage as well under partnership. So they're a really great place to go and kind of check out. Reach Hire is another one of ours. Eventbrite is an online uh, virtual uh, event place that you can go to and find ones for that as well. Um, it's really great with that one because you can say, hey, I'm interested in software engineering. And it will it will give you all of those options uh, for that. And then also uh, Power to Fly, another a partnership company of ours. But I recommend Googling. Uh, you're going to find ones in your area um, that may be a lot more enriching for you, as well as you might find ones that are more granular to what you're looking for. Um, OK, so. 
Uh, let's talk uh, the last one on utilizing your circle of influence. I'm going to touch on this really quickly. Um, we're going to go over it a little bit more in the next slide, but I want to kind of introduce you. So for those of you who don't understand what it means when I say use your circle of influence, what I'm referring to there is you have a circle of influence um, within the inner circle where you have the most influence is your friends and family. These are people that know you, that have worked with you or have had some contact with you and they know that they like you and they wanna help you. These are people that will be the most enriching for you for networking because they will be able to help you out the most. The next one is going to be friends of friends. These are people that your friends know that can introduce you to them. And then limited connection, which is the last circle of influence. And these are people where you may have a connection either in a relation to where you are. This may be people that know friends of friends of friends and not as, as promising, but still uh, another network if you haven't tapped in to tap into. Um, we're going to go over the three basic steps on how to network within those three industries, or th sorry, those three uh, categories. So the first one is reach out and explain what your goals are. Two is explain how they can help. And three is call to action. So number one is going to be, and I'm going to give you a for instance, uh, let's say I have a uh, friend of mine that owns a company and they have a website that isn't the best and I want to help them. <laughs> so I will reach out to my friend and say, hey, uh, you know, this is Christina. As you know, I'm going through the uh, full stack software engineering course. I'm trying to get experience in software engineering. Um, I noticed that you have a website that might need some updating. I noticed it hasn't been updated since X, Y, and Z, or it looks like you guys could add some new features. Uh, number two, which is explain how they can help. I would love to be able to build out a website for you guys and help you get a better online presence. Number three would be call to action. I would say, I'd love to have an opportunity for you to look over my portfolio and we can talk about what your needs are. Wouldn't it be a good time for us to just have coffee and talk about this? Super simple, something easy to reach out and to uh, put out uh, my feelers on getting this uh, to start. Another really good one, which would be good for you guys here uh, when you're reaching out to each other is, hi, I'm new to, this, uh, to the program for the full stack at Bottega. Um, two, I would love to be able to have a study buddy. I need someone to help me keep on track. And three, would you be open to talking with me. We can talk about what we're working on and share our projects. Super simple, easy way to connect with people that you already have connections with. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple of questions here. Meetups is really good. Yeah, meetups is really good. It's nice because you're going to be able to find a group of people that you wouldn't all, uh, normally be able to get in contact with um, until you actually join those. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, and then the, there's a really good one there. Put a link in there for a really good meetup you can go to. That's perfect. Uh, how easy is it to get a remote job if I am not living in the U.S., but I want to earn a U.S. dollar and do not want to move to the U.S.? Um, it's going to depend a lot on your uh, skill level. That's one. Two is remote jobs within the United States is pretty typical. Um, within the United States, I think most of what I'm finding is remote work. Um, however, some companies are going to have some requirements where they aren't allowed to hire outside of the, out of the country. So um, I would recommend doing some research on uh, where you're wanting, like what industry, because within software engineering, you can do front end, you can do back end, you can do full stack all different kinds, do research on that and then figure out uh, what region you're wanting to do. But that's definitely something that if you're wanting, reach out to me, career services at bottega.edu. Um, I can pull numbers and we can talk if you want, if you really want to get down to granulars, but it's going to depend. It's going to depend on where you're located and it's going to depend on your skill level. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, uh, Eric says a great resource to talk to uh, other uh, develop, sorry, other engineers in the app blind, a uh, ton of developers from different companies at all levels. It's true. It's true. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Now we're going to go over freelance work. So part of what you can do with networking is you can get into freelance work and freelance work is an area of basically saying, Hey, I'm offering my skills, not as a full-time employee, but on a project to project basis. Uh, and this can be a uh, formal where it is with someone who is a hiring company, or this could be informal with someone who is just simply wanting to say, hey, you have, a, you have a company and a website that needs to be updated. I know how to update it. Let's make something happen. It could be something as simple as that. But freelance is basically where you're providing your skills to another party or persons uh, in order to either develop your skills or even for pay. I'm a big advocate of freelance work, and I'll explain why I'm a big advocate for freelance. 
The biggest thing you're going to run into post-graduation is showcasing what you can do, explaining how, uh, at what level your skills are at. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one is being able to have work experience. Another is showing your education. And then another is also projects. The one that I see the most that is the most valued in our industry right now is work experience. And the interesting part is to get work experience, you need to already have work experience. So it's kind of that weird circle of how do I get experience without experience? Freelance work is the best way to do that. Um, finding either a company or a person that you can do a project for and be able to add them into your resume as work experience. Excuse me. Um, one of the uh, interesting thing that we're finding right now is oftentimes companies are looking for people that have work um, moxie and want to actually work hard and they still look for people that have work experience and the reason why is if you took the initiative to go out and find a freelance project or go out and find an internship and get some of that experience that tells them that you're willing to go and do the utmost to work for them as well so when it comes to getting placed they're willing to overlook having to teach you because you went ahead and showed initiative of hey I already did my steps of trying to get work experience. Now I'm wanting to learn how you guys do it. So it's really great to be able to utilize that. Uh, let's see here. Any questions in this one? Okay. All right. So Jim says, I just signed up for a hands-on lab building cloud native Java applications with Micron. Oh, nice. Okay. Cloud infrastructure for March 22nd from the virtual conference is posted. It's free. Uh, you must sign up ahead of time, though. Okay. Uh, if you put the link in that, uh, that'd be great, Jim. Uh, definitely good to get so, so that kind of exposure. That'd be really great. Um, awesome. Okay. So the next thing is how do we find freelance work? It is very similar to how we network. Basically, you're going to look in your industry or look in your network to find people that you have connections with. Two, it's going to be reaching out and talking to them and explaining what you're looking for. And then three is going to be um, planting seeds. So this is something as simple as um, if you were to reach out and say, hey, it looks like you have a website and they may say, we're not really ready yet. Letting them know, hey, I'm open. I will I'd love to work with you in any way that I can. And if you know anyone, let me know. And then the last one is follow-up. So follow-ups are really important. This is where you're going to go back and you're going to, uh, let's say you followed up with them last month, you're going to follow up with them again this month. And this is for everything that you do, whether it's applying for applications, whether it's reaching out for networking, whether it's trying to get projects off the ground, follow-up, follow-up, follow-up is the hardest thing to remember, but it's the most crucial thing that's going to get you to success. And it's because when it comes to networking and when it comes to freelance work, everyone's on their own times table. Everyone's doing their own stuff. They're not going to be ready right then and there. So always be willing to follow up with them. If you are wanting to build out your own template for reaching out to people, um, reach out to career services at particular EDU. We would be more than happy to um, actually help you guys figure out what to say. We've got stuff on the website you can use, but if you're wanting to really go over and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking about saying, what do you think? How should I approach this? Or even getting a list of how do I figure out who to reach out to, reach out to us. We're more than happy to help you guys figure out what your game plan is and then letting you guys just go crazy and start networking on your own. Um, but if you need help with getting started, definitely, definitely, definitely reach out. We're here to help. Uh, but step one is going to be making your own list. You're going to reach out or make a list to anyone that you are friends and family with, then you're going to reach anyone that you might want to network with. And then uh, lastly, if you see anything or any opportunities for a company that you're seeing with job postings and you want to figure out how to network with them, make a list of that too. And then you're just going to use your, your outreach template and just boom, 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 just send it out to them and rinse and repeat until you, you get their desired results. Awesome. Okay. Let's see, how do you recommend networking with people who are already working for companies? Um, and this one's from Eric. Uh, how do you recommend networking with people who are already working for companies? I think what you're asking is, how do I network with people that are already working in companies that I wanna get into? And that is a great question. If it's not, let me know, but I will go down that route until, we, until I get uh, corrected. So what that basically is going to entail is, uh, stalking them nicely on LinkedIn. Uh, good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a good first step. Yes. Stalk them on LinkedIn and reach out to them for a chat. And what you're going to say is something to the extent of, hey, this is who I am. 
this is what I'm doing. So, hi, this is Christina. I'm a junior developer. I'm just learning to code uh, at Bottega University. I'm going to be graduating on this date. I'd love to actually talk to you about what your job is like and what it's like to be a software engineer at your company. Something simple as that. Call to action would be, wouldn't it be a good time for us to just do a Zoom call or get coffee? And what you're going to be doing in that, in that talk with them is getting to know them as a developer and getting to know what it takes for them to get into their position. So asking them questions like, what was the onboarding process like? What did it take for you to get into the, into the industry? What languages do you guys use? At the end of, the, at the, end of the, the talk, if you are at a point where you're like, I like what I'm hearing, I do want to work with them, say to something to the extent of, well, I'd love to actually have you look over my portfolio and kind of figure out what it would take for me to get into the industry with you, uh, into a position like yours. Uh, would you be willing to kind of help coach me and look over my stuff and see if there's anything I can improve to get better? And in the conversation, they will say stuff like, well, you need to know JavaScript and Python, or you need to know X, Y, and Z. If that is the case and you want to get into that, that position, make a note and strengthen that skill and then come back to them and say, this is what I did. This is how I got into it. And then say, would you be willing to recommend me for this position? Getting an internal recommendation is amazing. It is going to up your percentage of actually getting the job. I think it's by like 60%, I think is what I read, or it was 50 or 60%. It's going to increase your, your chances of getting that job way better because companies are willing to hire people that are recommended with internally. If someone that works for them recommended you, that means you must be a good bet and you've got a higher chance of actually getting interviewed. Um, but that's a great question. So politely stalking them, but then uh, opening up with, hey, let's let's connect. I want to interview you and what your job is like. People like to talk about them themselves. Who wouldn't want to tell them what their job is like and how awesome it is? <laughs> awesome. Uh, what are salaries like for junior developers based on roles front end versus back end versus full stack? It will vary depending on the company to company. Uh, usually I'm seeing about 45 uh is the starting range. Um, it depends on your experience level. So some people may come into a company and the languages that are required are not where they're at yet. Um, so if you, you went into an industry uh, where that individual company uses their own proprietary language, or maybe that they use a language that you don't quite know and they're willing to train you, um, they may start you off a little bit lower or they may even start you off in a, um, uh, it's kind of like a apprenticeship sort of situation where they're willing to give you like a month to try and learn for a lower pay or for free. And then if you succeed, then they'll bring you on as a full-time employee, but it varies. Uh, so 45 is usually what I see, but it's going to depend on your skill level. Awesome. Awesome. I feel like I missed a few. Let me, let me go up and see if I missed any. No. Okay. Perfect. All righty. And I will try and speed through because I don't want to take up too much of uh, Alex's time. So let's say you're on this call and you're like, hey, hey, lady, don't forget me. I am already in the course or I've already just graduated and I'm looking to network um, uh, as well as I'm wanting to figure out what to do post-graduation. So post-graduation does not mean that you're done learning. You are never done learning. That is the beauty of this industry is you're always gonna have something new to learn. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to our senior uh, alumni that have been like, I've been in the industry for you know four, five, six years. I'm still learning. I'm still learning new stuff. And it's because the industry is ever evolving and every new position you get is going to have its own unique requirements. So when you're done graduating, there are lots of options to keep your, your education going. Things as simple as going to Bottega University and getting a degree. We offer a lot of degrees. Uh, Kelly, uh, our admissions director, actually came on uh, last uh, year, I believe, and it's the recordings on the, uh, the website if you want to go check it out. But she talked about all the different uh, career options and the different uh, degree options that we provide. Um, you're going to have access to DevCamp which is a uh, lifetime access. So even after you graduate and you're done, you're going to have lifetime access. You are more than welcome to keep going back. And if there's a language in this uh, stack that you're like, I just need a little bit more help on it, go back and relearn it. It's there for you for that reason, for you to continually learning. There's also places like Free Code Academy, Udemy, uh, doing projects, freelance work. Um, the main goal post-graduation is obviously going to be getting hired. That is goal number one. 
Goal number two, which is equally important, is don't stop learning. Keep building. Um, when you're done and you're graduated, your GitHub should still have stuff pushed out to it on a regular basis. You should still be doing projects post-graduation. The number one question I get that a lot of my students say they get stumped on at interviews is, what have you been working on since you graduated? And if there is a nothing on that zero, that is a red flag because that tells them that you're, you're not willing to do the work required to keep learning. One of the biggest things that you're going to want to do is showcase that you're an ever-growing individual. You are going to keep learning no matter what. So post-graduation, like we talked about before, find passion projects you can work on. Find some freelance work. Uh, find any excuse to learn a new language. Um, and then just keep going and decide, you know, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to keep learning. And that's good. That's, that's an exciting part about the industry. The last thing is, how do I decide what to work on? What languages? Uh, tip number one is going through job postings that you're going to be wanting to apply to and see what they're asking for. There may be languages that we didn't teach you that is niche to your industry and to your area or something like that. Add that to your list and learn that. Um, skills that you're needing for projects and freelance, as well as strengthening skills that you already have. We're teaching you the foundations of full stack, uh, full stack development. That does not mean that you're an expert in the field. It means you're a junior. You're a junior. It means you've got a lot still to learn. So don't ever feel like I'm graduated. I know everything. That's not how this works. We gave you the foundations so that you now can take what you've learned to go into the industry to learn even more while you're on the job. We gave you enough to get into the industry. It is now up to you to continue learning. And for some, that's going to be getting a degree. For others, it's going to be getting into uh, more granular uh, language uh, courses. So it's all up to where you want your journey to go. But that's definitely an option for you all. Let's see if we've got any questions before I turn the time over to Alex. I don't think I missed any, but let me go back and see if I missed any. Any. Um, any questions? I don't see any. OK, if I missed your question, put it back in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had so many go through. I'm sorry. I apologize if I missed your questions, but they were all great questions. Um, let me go ahead and turn the time over to Alex. Alex, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. Uh, OK, so today I am talking about capstone projects. And now I know we have a wide variety of uh, students here. Uh, some who are currently going through the course and, and learning and others who have graduated and are coming back for the, the dev meet. And we have some students who are, who are going through the capstone project right now as we speak, looking at you, my class. Uh, so I'm going to try to uh, break this down into general terms so that not only will it apply to the capstone project for the, the full stack course here, but also um, I want you to be able to take this as an approach for any project that you face, whether it's one in the course or one that you are working on after the course, um, either for a job or for a client or even just for yourself. Um, so I've broken down um, building a project like this into three steps. The first step being requirement elicitation, which means make sure that you know what's required for the project. Uh, now, if you've gone through the course, you know that Jordan has talked about this a, a couple times in a couple different videos. Um, he has one video where he gets on and he basically talks about this because the day before he turned in a project he was really proud of to the client, only to discover that what he had built was not in any way, shape, or form what they had actually been expecting, and it was a, a big mess. You you can see it in his eyes how how uh, personal that particular video is. Um, so make sure that you know what you need to build, so you don't end up building out a whole project, putting in all the time and effort, only to discover that it wasn't what you were supposed to be building. Um, now, when it comes to building something out for a client, there's many ways that we can actually uh, define a client. That could be someone that you have reached out to and they have asked you to build them a specific project or a specific feature. Um, in that case, that could be Bottega asking you to build out the capstone project, or it could be your boss at the place that you work handing you an assignment. In that case, 
your boss is the client, your workplace is the client, you're building it out for them. And in other situations, it's you who are the client. You are building out a project that you came up with and you want to build out, um, in which case, yeah, you are the client and you get to set your own requirements. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but in any case, whenever you're working on a project, the first thing to focus on always is what we call the MVP, the minimal viable product. That is the smallest bit of code that you could write to technically pass the requirements. After that, you could go on and make it as, as fancy as you like, but a client is not going to care about any amazing feature that you build if it's not what they asked for. You could go out and, you know, you could build the most gorgeous nav bar you have ever seen in your life. It could have all kinds of beautifully um, uh, collected colors and fonts, all of which go perfectly together. It could have um, awesome animations that you've included with great features, custom drop-down boxes, um, all kinds of stuff. But you know, if the client asks you to build them a calculator app, they don't care that you built an amazing nav bar. They wanted a calculator app and you didn't build that. So step one of any project, focus on that minimal viable product, just the basic requirements. Um, and if you are the client building your own project, these requirements can be generated in step two, which I'm gonna talk about, which is gonna be planning. Um, but if you have any other clients, make sure that you understand what is being asked of you before you get started. So on that note, what are the requirements for the capstone project for Bottega? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we can take a look at the final project directions. And right towards the beginning, we have the capstone project requirements. And I'm gonna go through these and talk about each one. Um, but I'm actually gonna skip, instead of starting at the very top, I'm gonna to skip down just a little bit to this section right here. You must build a microservice app process. If you're just starting the course and you have no idea what that means, don't worry, you're gonna learn all about it. That's what you're gonna be uh, building out in the course, um, especially in the, the back half. Um, but what this means is that you have both a front end and a back end. Um, as it says here, the back end should be in Python or Ruby or any other back end language, but most likely Python because that's what you're learning in the course. And the back end must be connected to the front end via API. The front end being written out in React or Angular or any other front end language, but again, most likely React because that's what you're learning in the course. Um, so that means that you're going to have two separate projects. And this is something that I always want to stress when it comes to capstone projects. That's two separate projects, one for the front end and one for the back end. Um, and then your back end, it's going to include a database, most likely SQL, utilizing SQL Alchemy, again, because that's what you learned in the course. Um, but it could be a, another type of database like Mongo, we also learn um, some Mongo commands in the course or any other database that you want to utilize. So now that we have a basic understanding of the, the layout of the, the capstone project, this microservice app process uh, with a front end and back end, let's go ahead and go back to the beginning and talk about this requirement. You must build a project using six of each from the following lists. First off, we have 
languages, and technologies. And when we understand this microservice app process that we're, we're building out, how or we should have a React front end with a Python back end with a SQL database connected via API. When we actually look at this list, and don't worry if you have no idea what these words mean at this point, if you're just starting the, the course, these are all the things you're gonna learn in the course. But when we actually look at this list, um, it kind of becomes uh, hard to exclude any of these items. I mean, how are you going to build your Python backend without Python or your React front end without React? It's actually going to be hard not to utilize GitHub after all the training you receive throughout the course. How are you going to connect the two via API without some kind of Ajax or Fetch or Axios call? How are you not going to use JSON or styles or data types or a, a database, SQL or NoSQL, or you know any of these. These become really difficult not to use when you have your focus set on building that microservice app front end and back end. Similarly, methodologies and best practices, six from this list as well. If you're building out a proper um, app that has things like user authentication maybe, or just getting data from the database and checking to make sure that there's data there, or even just things like looping through a collection of data to display it on a page. How are you not going to use control structures? Those are just things like conditionals and loops, those kinds of structures in your, your programming that help the data flow. Similarly, how are you not going to be using algorithms? Functions set up to get the data in one format and display it in another format. And you know, if you go in to build in a capstone project and you're not planning on making it a quality project, I don't know what to tell you, right? Um, so all of these from this list, um, you, you can read them here. These are all things that are hard not to include in your project. So when you're looking at this, uh, this rubric here, the, the requirements, don't panic if you're like, oh man, I have to have six from each list. Instead, if you focus on what I said, building out that front end and back end, React, Python, microservice app process, um, these are gonna come naturally. It's gonna be hard to exclude any of them, like I said. Um, and now we get to the fun part of the project right here. You must include one language or feature or framework that you did not learn in the course. Now, as a, a new student, that might sound really scary. Oh, oh my goodness, what do you mean I have to put something into the project that I, I didn't learn? But when you actually get to the capstone project, this becomes uh, extremely exciting. This is something that you get to go out and say, hey, what do I want to add to my project? There's all sorts of resources out there. Uh, there's some examples here, search bars, payment processing, picture carousels, all kinds of little things you can add. Um, some other examples that, that I came up with here, uh, password encryption with bcrypt, that's pretty common. Uh, image hosting with Cloudinary, if you want to be able to save images in your database. Um, session storage with cookies or JWT tokens, if you want to be able to do like logins and uh, keeping people logged in. Um, React Hooks is extremely popular right now um, as an addition to React. You could go out and learn those. Uh, sending emails, for example, a, uh, I forgot my password type button in your app. Um, this is really exciting. Basically, any 
difficult or complicated feature that you're faced with, you can ask yourself, hey, is there a library or API out there for that? For example, I was building um, a project recently for myself um, and I wanted to be able to include a, a box um, that basically had autocomplete capability. So as you're typing in the box, it would look at all the, the past responses that you've made. And it would, as you type, filter through those and put those underneath the box as you're typing. And then you could just select one of those from the, the drop-down menu. And I was thinking about that and saying, that's, that's what I want to do, but that sounds kind of tricky to actually code. Let me see if there's a, an autocomplete library for React. Quick Google search. Sure enough, there it was. And I was able to just read the documentation and implement it into my project and it worked perfectly. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, I know my class right now is working on their capstone projects and they keep popping in and saying, hey, is it all right if I, I show everyone this cool library that I just discovered and, and uh, thinking about using or, or I just thought was neat and that's awesome to see that, that excitement for learning new stuff. So after that, the next one here, this one is pretty basic, but it's one that I see students forget quite a lot of the time because you're focused on getting all the functionality and everything working. Um, but the app must be mobile responsive, which means that it needs to be able to work on both a desktop screen as well as a phone screen. And if you don't know how to test for mobile responsiveness on Chrome, um, I wanna show you real fast uh, a nice way to do that. So over here, I have a tab. We're gonna talk about this project here in a, a second. But if you go to the inspect tool here, Right up here is a, a button that says toggle device toolbar. And this is one that I use constantly for every project that I build. It basically puts your app inside a different device screen. Over here, there's a, a drop down. You can select different devices, all these different uh, phones or iPads or things like that. You can just select that tab here. It puts it in that dimension and you can double check that your project is going to actually fit on that screen size. I recommend using the, the smallest screen size settings that you can find here in the, the tools. Um, I believe that's either gonna be um, the iPhone 5, if you're on a slightly older version of Google Chrome, or um, it looks like mine just updated recently. And I believe, if, it's now the Samsung Galaxy S8 is going to be the, the smallest width. But you can play around with that and, and find whatever's working for you. But I find if it works on the smallest size setting, you can easily make it work on any bigger settings as well. Um, so going back to the final directions here, um, the next one. It must be hosted on any hosting service, AKA Heroku or some other hosting service. Um, something that allows it to be live on the internet. So anyone can come and use your app. Um, local host is not a hosting service. I sometimes uh, see that, that confusion. Local host is just on your computer, it's just local. So this needs to be hosted online. And finally, it is permissible to use tutorials, but the tutorial cannot make up more than 40% of the final capstone project. So tutorials are great. They're fantastic. It's awesome that there are so many um, people out there willing to put together uh, some little coding demos to, to help you learn how to code. That's what we love about the coding community. Um, absolutely use them for inspiration when you're trying to figure out what you want to build. 
um, use them to figure out a specific code block or component that you're working on. If you're stuck and it's not working, you can pull up some tutorial, see how they built it out, and then try and take that and get it to work in your project. This is great for learning a new feature. Pull up a tutorial on a new feature and go through the tutorial. And by the way, anytime you're learning a, a new feature or anything, spin yourself up a little demo project that you can include that, that feature in just to learn the feature. Make sure that you know how to import it correctly, uh, what methods and attributes you can call to get it to work, uh, what data you need to provide to get it to work. Just make yourself a little test pro project um, so that you're not trying to implement it into your, your larger project and trying to fight with different uh, variables that you might have to, to debug. Um, but yes, find a, a tutorial on, on it, learn how to use it, that's great. What you're not going to do is just take the entire tutorial, <laughs> slap your name on it, and turn it in. We will catch you and it will be bad. Don't do it. Um, but other than that, absolutely. Look, look at tutorials, uh, see how to implement different features or take inspiration um, and then build out your own project with that. So, um, I have an example project here. This is what we just saw. So this is a very minimal project that technically meets all of the requirements for the uh, capstone project. So what we have here, we have a home page with a couple buttons. We have a nav bar up here. And if I go to items, you can see there's some user experience here, letting them know that it's loading. Um, it's going to be a little bit slow the first time, but there we go. Once it's done loading, the items pop in. Those are coming from the API that's communicating with the database. We also have the ability to add items with this little form here. Um, let's see if I add, say, a movie for uh, $5.99 at the item, you could see uh, the submitting text popped up there. Uh, again, good user experience, letting them know something's happening. That's now added here to my items. And if I refresh the page, you can see that that was actually added to the database permanently. Um, so again, this is two separate projects that we are looking at here. If I actually go to the um, Heroku page for this, I have one project for the front end and one project for the back end. If I go to GitHub, I have a GitHub repository for the front end and I have a GitHub repository for the back end. So two separate projects. Also, let's talk about features here. So this is that microservice app process that we talked about. I just showed you the front end and the back end. Um, it's included all of the features from each list, not, not just six, but we have React, we have Python, we have HTML, we have styles and all of that. Um, it is mobile responsive. If I inspect the page, we can see, let's see. There we go. We can see mobile responsiveness when it's on a smaller size screen. It collapses down into a column instead of um, a row. And that looks pretty good, all the different pages. Um, and obviously, this is hosted online at herokuapp.com. Anyone can go to this link here and access this project. Uh, the only thing that this would be missing is something that wasn't learned in the course. So this is where you get to get creative and add new features that you want to implement. Um, and then my biggest piece of advice when um, 
you go to start your, your project is check in with a mentor before starting. Just verify, hey, these are my plans. I want to build an app that has this for the front end, this for the back end. These are the features that I want to implement. Does that meet the requirements? Um, the mentors are a, a great resource there for you to be able to just talk to, make sure everything's looking good. Before you get started, get a little ways in and say, wait a minute, wasn't there something about uh, needing a back end or, or a database or something? That way you don't waste a, a lot of time. Um, so, okay, that is the uh, capstone project requirements, what we're looking for. Basically, if you're in that mindset of a front end and a back end with the data, connect the two via API, you're in a, a good spot. Um, so step two is planning. And like I said before, if you're the client, this is where you can figure out your requirements for your project. Um, and if you're not the client, this is where you make sure that your features are meeting the MVP. So we have uh, several tools for planning out our projects. Um, that includes UI, UX. Um, we have a whole section of the course on that. That includes prime objective, user stories, sitemap, and low fidelity wireframes, just planning out what your app is going to look like on the front end side of things. On the back end side of things, we have UML. Um, most students love UML, right? Usually not, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but that's because you haven't learned what it can do for you yet. Building out class diagrams to visualize your database tables, figuring out what kind of data you're gonna need. Building out some activity diagrams to figure out how the flow of data is going to work. Um, another quick example that I have is this one over here. This was a project that um, my class and I, we built out together. This is a, a quote of the day app where you can click here and every day there is a, a new quote. This one does not have fantastic uh, user experience. You can see it's loading here, but it's taking a while. There we go. But each day you come and there's a quote, Today is be yourself. Everyone else is already taken by Oscar Wilde. Um, but we wanted this to be an app where every day there's the same quote for everyone. And then tomorrow it automatically updates to swap the quote out for a new one. So there was a number of components that we had to build. Um, and so we got to planning. So we, we talked about our, our user stories. We kind of went through them, what the user was going to see on the page, how they're gonna interact with it. And through those user stories, we built this site map and low fidelity wireframes where we decided we'd have a home page with a nav bar that would take you either to the quote page or the about page, as well as a way to just get to the quote page directly from the home page, skipping the nav bar completely. And to do so, we built out these little low fidelity wireframes so that we'd know what kind of components we would be using on each page. And so with that in mind, we then thought about the, the, the database. What was that gonna look like? Well, we needed to display a quote as well as keep track of some kind of date object. So we built out some UML diagrams. It's very simple here. They might look scary when you go through the course and Jordan builds out some really massive UML diagrams. They don't have to be that scary. Just a couple little um, structures here, a couple little tables explaining what data was gonna be in the quote, as well as what kind of actions we are going to take on it. And then figuring out um, how to actually get the quote from the database. We built out an activity diagram showing the exact steps that were going to be taken, the different conditionals we would have, and which actor 
was going to need to perform each action. So building out and planning your app, get into it right at the beginning. This will save you a lot of time on not only your capstone project, but on any project. So I am running out of time here, but are there any questions that anyone would like to ask on either the capstone project requ requirements or how to plan out your app? I believe you're muted, Christina. Can you hear me now? There we go. Perfect. Um, so real quick, just to jump in, uh, before we jump into questions, we do have a, quite a few. Um, so Terry uh, Roberts actually did a, a dev meet last month. If you guys wanna go check out the, re the recording where he talked all about planning out your capstone project, planning out any project, more of the prep to doing this. So kind of like the, the pre to what you did. Um, if you guys are wanting to get a little bit more to that, go and watch that video as well. Um, we do have quite a few questions here. Let me pull up, there was one. Yeah. And I, I wanna second that Terry did a fantastic job and yeah. I actually pulled a lot of inspiration from that when I was uh, um, setting up my, my planning stage. Perfect. Okay. So one of the questions was, can you use uh, Next.js for your capstone project? Um, you absolutely can. That would absolutely um, uh, be the, the new feature that you didn't learn in the course. Um, so you could set up your front end using something like that. Um, and then of course you'd still need a back end as well. Um, I would let you know to just keep in mind that the larger scale feature that you decide to go out and include, um, the more different it is than what's in the course, the less the mentors and, and everyone here are going to be able to help with it because they won't know it exactly how it, how it works and everything. So I do recommend that unless you really know what you're doing, um, I do recommend that React front end and Python back end because that's what's in the course. Perfect. And another one is: Is Latin a universal language for coding? What was that? Oh, is Latin universal language for coding? Um, no. If you're referring to like lorem, Ipsum, oh, it's an inside joke. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, go go ahead. Go ahead and answer it. Yep. Um, you're going to see lorem ipsum a, a lot. And that is the universal language for placeholder text encoding. But other than that, I think that's the only place you see Latin encoding. <laughs> Perfect. I think that's all of them. I did want to see an example, but you were great. You showed an example. I'm trying to see if there's any other that we missed. I don't think so. I think we got most of them. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Alex, for coming. Thanks for talking about uh, Capstone projects and running us through all of it. For all of you, I put the link in the chat function, but if you're wanting to see um, what some of these requirements are, if you just want to curious, want to check out what the Capstone requirements are, if you go to bottega.edu, go into the programs tab and it's under the full stack program. It's at the very bottom. It'll talk about all the requirements that are required for a Capstone project, what we talked about today. And then that way you can kind of prep yourself beforehand uh, before reaching out to a, a mentor. Awesome, awesome. Any other questions before we jump off? Awesome, no, awesome. Thank you, Alex, so much for coming. Thank you everyone for coming and participating. Um, we are so happy to have you all here and you all have a wonderful evening and we will see you guys next time.